Hi, good afternoon. Um, Colin and I will be talking about our um, research project, which is looking at the Northern Ireland Bill of Rights um, in the context of Brexit. And the Bill of Rights is one of those possible solutions that has been referred to um, in previous presentations. And it takes on a new importance in light of Brexit. Rory and Colin referred to the real and serious threats to human rights and equality protections posed by Brexit. And a Bill of Rights could be the vehicle to enhance those existing human rights and equality protections, but also to provide supplementary rights to reflect the changing circumstances brought about by Brexit. So what Colin and I are going to do in this presentation this afternoon is we will talk about what we're doing, and what we're doing, why we are doing it, how we are doing it, and what are the next steps. So what we are doing, it's an independent research project funded by Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust. And at this stage, I would like to publicly acknowledge the role that Professor Monica McWilliams helped to secure the funding for this project. Monica was involved in this project in the early stages, but due to personal reasons, Monica had to withdraw from the project. And so Colin has now replaced Monica. So in the project, our main aim is to reflect and think about the next steps to progress the Northern Ireland Bill of Rights. Because as many of you will know only too well that the Bill of Rights is one of those outstanding commitments, outstanding issues arising from the peace agreement, the Belfast Stroke Good Friday Agreement. And under that agreement, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission was tasked, was mandated to deliver advice on a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. After a lengthy drafting process, they delivered that advice in December 2008. Almost a year later, the Northern Ireland office responded in November 2009 and it was quite dismissive in its response. And since then, there has been really little political engagement on this particular issue. Though we do note that at times, the Bill of Rights has re-emerged in the current negotiations in trying to restore devolution. So how are we trying to progress the Northern Ireland Bill of Rights. We're doing several things. First of all, we have taken the Commission's advice in 2008 and have translated that into a draft model bill. We are very fortunate to have a brilliant draft person as part of this project called Eamon Moran, and it's actually due thanks to the Office of the Legislative Council here in um, Stormont, um, Brenda King, who found um, Eamon Moran. Eamon is originally from Northern Ireland, but he's based in Australia, and he has a lot of experience in terms of drafting legislation. Um, indeed, he was involved in drafting the Victoria Charter. So Eamon has drafted, we handed over the advice that the Commission submitted to Eamon, and he has translated that advice into a draft model bill. And by doing that, we hope that the project, it's more practical, it's a more practical approach, because it makes it more real. And if you, um, you can download the draft model bill by clicking on that link. Um, of course, there are going to be limitations to any such projects. We are aware that there were many contributions to the project, um, but to respect the remit of the agreement, 
we thought that a good place to start was to use the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission's advice. At this stage, I think it's worthwhile to just have a brief recap as to what that advice recommended, because it was nine years ago. So the advice was Human Rights Act Plus. And for those of you who may not be as familiar with the Human Rights Act, the Human Rights Act incorporates the European Convention on Human Rights that Rory referred to, and it's primarily a civil and political rights document. Um, so the Commission's advice goes beyond what's contained in the European Convention on Human Rights. So the advice includes recommendations on a stronger equality and non-discrimination clause, social and economic rights, children's rights, um, victims' rights, identity and cultural rights. And all of those rights are subject to judicial enforcement. Oops, I'm going backwards. The advice also included innovative recommendations. So, for example, annual reporting to the Assembly, if there ever was one, um, and to the Westminster Parliament on the progress the establishment of a human rights committee in the Assembly and a five-year independent review. It would apply both to the Assembly and to the Executive and it would have horizontal as well as vertical application. And for those non-lawyers, that basically means it would apply to states as well as private individuals. Another limitation that we are aware of is that when the Commission delivered its advice, it lacked consensus both within the Commission and outside the Commission. There were two Commissioners that dissented from the Commission or from the advice. And generally, there can be, it can be described as three schools of thought around the Commission's advice. One school of thought is that the Commission's advice went too far. It was too maxim um, it was too it adopted um, a, a maximist approach. Those who um, favour a minister approach feel that the commission shouldn't have included rights that they did, most notably social and economic rights, because they don't really reflect the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. A second school of thought is that they support the Commission's advice, they adopted the right approach, they were right to include all the rights that they included. And the third school of thought, and this school of thought tends to be drowned out by the other two schools of thought, there are those that think that the Commission's advice didn't go far enough. Another limitation is that Remember, the Commission submitted their advice in 2008. Nine years later, and in light of Brexit, it is obviously outdated in parts. Fourthly, the Commission's advice was a compromise, and that, that point tends to be forgotten. Fifthly, what our research project is about it's about capturing the intention of the Commission's advice properly in legislation, but it is a work in progress. The draft model bill that we have produced is a draft model bill. We are asking people to provide feedback on that draft model bill. So to enable people to provide feedback. What we are doing, in addition to producing this draft model bill of rights, we are hosting a number of events. We launched our draft model bill in Belfast on the 28th of June. And the feedback from that event was very positive. People thought that what we were doing was very, um, a very practical approach. Um, to progressing the Northern Ireland Bill of Rights. 
So we're going to be hosting more events. So in McGee, in the McGee campus in Derry, we are holding an event on the 29th of November. Again, allowing people to contribute to the project, both orally and also by submitting written submissions as well. We're going to be holding another event. Um, again, it's going to be like a, an evidence session event where people can contribute to the project, saying what rights do they think should be included in a draft model bill in light of Brexit. Um, that event will be co-organised with the Human Rights Consortium and the provisional date is the 14th of December, um, which will be part of the Human Rights Festival Week, um, but those dates have yet to be confirmed. Um, and at this stage, I will hand it over to Colin, who's going to wear his other hat, and he's going to be talking about the feedback that we have received so far on the draft model bill. So thank you. Hello again. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so really just to follow on from Anne, what, what we've done is initially we've taken that advice from the Commission in uh, December 2008 and we've turned it into legislation using a draft person to, to, to do that. Now, uh, in doing that, we, we had a long discussion about that because we're conscious that that advice was submitted to the British government. It's quite clear that the Belfast Good Friday Agreement is clear that it's Westminster legislation, that it should be taken forward. So we thought it would be helpful to take that step of actually putting this in legislation. But since we've done that, we have solicited feedback and we've had some feedback in relation to the bill itself. And I think as Anne has said, one of the notable things about the, this conversation that's been a bit lost is that that at the time the advice was submitted and before it was submitted, there were also those in this conversation who felt the Commission had perhaps gone too far, but people who felt that the Commission hadn't gone far enough. And in a sense, what, what was lost, I think, in the period after the Commission adv advice was the sense in which it was a compromised document and a compromised document that is well worth revisiting. For example, when we looked at the translated sections in the draft model bill, there are bits of there are bits of that advice, for example, on issues around culture and identity that are well worth having a look at in terms of the current discussion that's ongoing around the negotiations around those issues. Uh, there are a lot of very interesting proposals in that document, I think, that are well worth revisiting as now, but as we take this project forward. In terms of feedback, we're at very, it's fair to say we're at a very initial stage in some of this, and we've had some initial feedback, but people have talked about children's rights, the rights of refugees and asylum seekers, issues around equal citizenship and voting rights, and questions of uh, the right to vote, freedom of movement, and the EU debate, obviously Brexit has loomed very large in that. And in a number of the responses we've had, we've referenced to the equality protections of the EU that have been mentioned earlier, the references to EU citizenship rights. We've had references to stronger protections for women's rights, for example, in any future Bill of Rights, and questions around marriage equality as well. So we've had a number of initial responses to the draft. Anne has provided the link to the website. So please download it, have a look. It's a continuing conversation, and please uh, contribute to it. And if you have views, let us know. So what we'll be doing with this, and very much uh, work in progress, is we're going to be listening at those meetings, we're going to be looking at that feedback, and then we're going to be producing a policy report next year to give a sense of the state of play. And we're going to be disseminating that policy report quite widely. Now, one of the aims of that report is to include, obviously, a narrative section in that report, but also to, to flesh out, to inform a public debate around what would some of these clauses look like. Um, now, I have to declare an interest here because I was on the Human Rights Commission when this advice was submitted. Um, but one of the things that was really striking at the time was that despite some of the public debates around these issues, what we, we had found was that when we looked around the world at comparative experience, 
when we looked at the international community, these were quite standard things that other societies are actually doing. And I think when you do look at these clauses and what they actually look like in, in practice, they put the debate in a bit of perspective. A lot of states around the world are doing things, for example, on socioeconomic rights. And the Bill of Rights advice from Northern Ireland reflected that. I think one of the great tragedies of the debate that followed is an awful lot of tortuous thought went in in that advice as to how you balance the questions of national identity here with a broader human rights and equality framework. And I think the advice does that rather well. And I think it'd be a very, very useful document to revisit in the current discussions. And we'll be really using it as a template going forward. I think the other thing we noticed, and I think we don't like to underline is, in our, it was such a significant constitutional exercise here for which many, many people invested an awful lot of time and thought and effort over a long period of time from what was launched on the 1st of March until the advice was submitted in December 2008. People will remember in this room the Bill of Rights Forum as well that met from, I think, late 2006 onwards. So a lot of work was invested in what was a major constitutional project. And I think it's important we bring our mind back to that. And I think it's also strategically important what's come out of our conversations is really the sense in which you cannot have, and it's unfair to have, those sorts of significant constitutional conversations and just leave them and pretend it's okay to just leave them. So I think what we're trying to do in a small and limitedly funded way, I'd like to emphasize, is to try and nudge this debate forward a bit by putting some kind of, by putting legal text around some of that advice. The great thing about Northern Ireland, which I think we're in this place, that we're often, uh, when you hear some media and other reports about this place, is the point I made earlier, is that there are an awful lot of solutions already on the table across this area. And the human rights debate and equality debate is no different. For example, we have the advice from the Human Rights Commission in December 2008, which we're going to take forward. Fascinatingly, that advice was Human Rights Act Plus, so it built on the Human Rights Act that is already there. But also in the context of Brexit, we also have the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and how that has developed as well as a, as a pre-existing legal entity that we can work from and within. So in a sense, uh, the advantage of this conversation is that Anne and I are not starting this project from a blank page. We're starting the project from a number of innovative solutions that are already there. So in a sense, to bring the, that back to Brexit, just two final points, I think. First of all, Brexit makes the conversation about the Bill of Rights and the work that has been done on that both timely, necessary and urgent. The second point relates to that is I think there's a real disturbing trend that we picked up and it's a trend that the answer to, to Brexit can be found in a set of technical fixes that will make the larger constitutional questions go away. But I think what is absolutely clear in relation to Northern Ireland is that those larger constitutional questions around rights and equality cannot be wash, washed away, wished away or airbrushed out of the picture. I think one of the trends we've noticed in looking at the Good Friday Belfast Agreement coming up to the 20th anniversary is that trend of human rights and equality being quietly airbrushed out of the picture. And I think what we're trying to do in this project is bring that in. Brexit in this area is not about a set of discrete technical fixes. We're in a profound constitutional moment for Northern Ireland and this island, and we need to elevate the conversation to that constitutional level, I think. Thank you very much.